All right, welcome to the co online causal inference seminar. Today, we're excited to have Mona Azadkia from uh, ETH Zurich, who will talk about a fast non-parametric approach for causal structure learning in polytrees. In Q&A, we'll have Armin. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, put them there. After that, we'll have a discussion by Brian Aragam. Um, questions today will be handled by Ying. So I'll switch over to her now. Well, thank you very much. Uh... What happened here? Uh, huh. Ah, now I can share. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Uh, so, okay, now I think you can see my slides. Uh, I'm excited to share uh, one uh, new work with uh, my colleagues uh, about fast non-parametric approach for local causal structure learning. Uh, this is a work done by, uh, by uh, Peter Bowman and Armin Taeb, and Armin today is uh, here and will help us in Q&A. &A. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask him. So let's jump into the problem. So let's assume that we have a set of given variables and we are particularly interested in one of them. Let's consider that one as y. And we want to see whether that given observational data, is it possible to figure out the set of patterns of this node of a special interest? In this example, x1, x2, and x3. So um, I'm just going to start with going through some definitions. Hopefully, we will go through them quickly so that you don't get bored. So uh, in, in general, to kind of... Uh, model this problem in a more mathematical way, we assume that we can describe the relationship between our variables using a, uh, the directed graphs, which we call the DAG, which are with a bunch of node variables, which one of them we again is uh, of importance to us, which we show it by Y, and a bunch of uh, edges. Now, there is some causal relationship between the nodes in this graph that we are considering, and I'm going to show that relationship. Oops, sorry. I'm going to show that uh, the, that relationship in, in this shape, that the node xi is a function of a bunch of other nodes and some noise variable. Through this talk, we will assume that these noise variables are independent of each other, and also we will assume that this function fi is a measurable function. Just uh, note that we are just putting this measurability assumption and uh, no particular assumption on the, for example, whether the noise is additive or something on that shape. Uh, so, in general, in a DAG, we, uh, for a given node Y, we define the set of parents of this node Y as, this, as those set of uh, variables that uh, are connected directly to that variable Y and the, and the, with an edge, and the direction of is, that edge is toward Y. Uh, and we here we denote the, the set of parents uh, in this shape with P A of Y. Mona, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. There's quite a bit of background noise right now. Um, uh, yeah, I'm actually hearing it. Um, the problem is that let's see whether I have anything. So if you know how you can fix it, you, uh, if you know, but like yeah, I don't have. Let all me right. just quit all the. Google the Chrome tabs I have, but I don't have any other thing that is running. So I think just my computer right, just yeah, got fired for some reason. Sorry yeah. about it. Um, so so as we have we defined the set of parents in this shape, and then we have similarly we have the set of children, which I show it by ch of y, and uh, the set of children on those nodes that are again directly connected to y, but this time the direction of edge is coming from y to those children, and then at the end we have the set of spouses of y, which we show it by sp, which are basically those nodes that share the some same children with y, so xi is a, a spouse of y, if we have this kind of a relationship in the DAG somewhere. For example, in this uh, toy example that we have here, these red nodes are all parents of Y, the orange nodes are all children of Y, and this blue node is the spouse of Y. Uh, so 
at the end of the day, understanding these causal relationships between the nodes using this probabilistic notion is basically understanding the this joint probability distribution between the variables that we have and uh, boiling it down to some directed graph somehow is too much of simplification because we may actually not be able to just pick one graph. Uh, what I mean is that there might be, for, for a joint probability distribution on a bunch of variables, there might be actually more than one graph that can capture that distribution. And that is something that we uh, define it or uh, characterize it uh, as the notion of Markov equivalence class. And basically, a Markov equi equivalence class is the set of all DAGs that capture the same conditional independencies. Uh, so, for example, we may have D1 to DL uh, different DAGs that are actually, all of them are capturing the same uh, conditional uh, independence uh, between the variables uh, that we have, uh, we, we are caring for. Uh, but there is some easy way to distinguish uh, whether two DAGs are equivalent or not, and that is if they share the same skeleton, by skeleton I mean just take the DAG, remove the directions, and the remaining undirected graph is going to be a skeleton. So if they have the same skeleton, and if they have the same VS structures, and by VS structure I mean if you have uh, two edges that are directing to the same um, uh, uh, node. So if they share this V structure and the skeleton, the DAGs are going to be um, equivalent to each other. So now assume that we are in this situation that we have some a, a bunch of different DAGs that are actually equivalent to each other and capture the same conditional independencies that our data uh, shows. So for each of these DAGs, I'm going to look at this uh, node Y that I was interested in, and I'm going to look at the parents of this node Y. And I'm going to put these parents in, uh, in a set. If I do the same thing for all of these tags, I will end up having a collection of all the set of parents that are actually, each of these sets are going to the, be the parent set of Y in one of these equivalent situations. And I'm going to show that with this curly P of Y. So curly P of Y is going to be the all the possible uh, set of parents of Y in different scenarios. Uh, and note that this is, we, we have some properties here. The first property is that uh, this collection of parents is usually only one. So basically I will only have one possible set of parents. And that is when we have a V structure that is pointing at Y. So if I have this node of Y, and if I have at least two parents for Y, so let's say that I have X1 and X2 parents of Y, because the Markov equivalent tags should sh share this uh, V structure, then all of them, in all of the Markov equivalence tags, I will have X1 and X2 as a set of parents. So at the end of the day, in all these different DAGs that capture the structure of my dependencies, I will have the same set of parents. But it can happen that actually Y only has, for example, one parent in some scenario. So if I have this situation, I, I can also have this other situation that X2 is actually pointing to uh, y, and I cannot distinguish uh, these two situations. So I, at, the, at the end, what I can say that is that I have a case that I call x1 the parent of y, and I have, a, I have a situation in which I would call x2 the parent of y. But this is, at, well, at the level of observational data, we cannot go further than that. So, and then the last definition that I need to tell you is just about the Markov blanket and Markov boundary. So for a given uh, set of, uh, for, for a given node Y, uh, a set I will call uh, a subset of the variables, the, the remaining variables that I have, I would call it a Markov blanket or a sufficient set if given those uh, variables, uh, I, I have this independence of Y with the rest of the variables. So basically a Markov blanket or a sufficient set is the set of all those variables that knowing them 
is enough to gain any information about why, and I do not need to assume anything further than the uh, Markov blanket. Um, a Markov blanket, uh, if exists, is not necessarily unique, and uh, it can vary in size. For example, if you have a set that is Markov blanket, adding any variable would, would not uh, basically lose this property of being Markov blanket. But reducing any uh, any variable would actually you may not be a Markov blanket anymore. So in this sense, we can define a minimal Markov blanket, and we call a minimal Markov blanket a Markov boundary. And in this work, I will show the Markov boundary of my node Y with this uh, MB of Y. So now let's get back to the business now we are done with the definitions and i can actually tell you that what we are what we want to do so what we wanted to do is that we wanted to figure out for a given node y what are the set of nodes that are parents of y so the problem is that i had this node x1 to xp and i wanted to search over x1 to xp for the set of nodes that are parents of y and if p is large enough the space of these variables that I'm doing my search over might be huge. So is there a way to actually reduce the size of my searching environment? And the answer is fortunately yes. And that's by looking at this equality. So basically we can write down the Markov boundary of a given node Y as the union of the set of parents, the set of children, and the set of spouses. So uh, if we somehow now can get to the Markov boundary of Y, we can forget about all the other stuff, all the other nodes in the DAG, and just focus our search among the variables that are in the Markov boundary of Y. And now the question is that, how should we do that? How should we go about finding the Markov boundary? Is there any question so far? Um, there is no question so far. Uh, we can continue, thanks. Okay. okay. So, now for the Markov boundary search, we are going to use an algorithm called FOSI. So FOSI is a forward stepwise variable selection algorithm, which is based on a non-parametric measure of conditional dependence introduced by uh, myself and my PhD advisor, Shor of Chatterjee, uh, which we call it CODEC. Uh, FOSI has some nice properties, one of them being that it, is, uh, it has a natural stopping rule and therefore no one, you, you don't, in, in order to use it you do not need to have a tuning parameter. Uh, so it, it makes it particularly interesting. And so let me tell you what is FOSI and how does it work. So given any measure of uh, dependence, one can implement a very a simple a stepwise uh, algorithm for variable selection. But what makes FOSI particularly interesting is that the measure that it is using, uh, that the FOSI is using is non-parametric with some uh, nice properties uh, and it can be implemented super quickly. So let's first uh, look at the measure that we are using. So the measure is defined in this way. I just want to emphasize that please don't get lost by the definition of the measure because he, today we are just using it as a black box, but I just put the definition here if you want to look at it. But this measure, so he, T of Y and Z given X is basically going to tell us how much Y depends on a vector of variable Z given a vector of variables X. So it is a conditional measure of dependence with some properties. What are these properties? First of all, it is a bounded measure. So it's always between zero and one. And this boundedness, particularly today, we are going to use this boundedness implicitly in the algorithm. And the end of this spectrum, one and zero, they have uh, specific meanings in the sense that the measure of dependence is going to be one if and only y is a function of z given x. And it is equal to zero if and only y is independent of z given x. Now, just by a quick look at the definition of this measure, you may be like, okay, it seems a little bit complicated because there is some integration involved, there's some uh, conditional expectation, I don't have the distribution of my variables a priori, so actually, how am I going to calculate this, all this stuff? Fortunately, 
it comes with an estimator that actually do not do, do not require to actually calculate these integrals and expectation and it's much makes our life much easier so the definition of this estimator here i again put it here for you but the <laughs> the point that you just need to take out from this slide is that the estimator requires calculating three things three ingredients some nearest neighbors in this search and some ranking and both finding the ranking and this nearest neighbor search all of this can be done super quickly in n log n time for nearest neighbor search in fixed dimension there are algorithms can can do it in n log n time and for finding the ranks of our variable y it's just sorting the variable y so it's super quickly and therefore the, the the this estimator of our measure of dependence is super quick computationally and also it does not require us to know have any knowledge on the disjoint dis probability distribution or estimate the, the, the probability distribution which is a hard task so at the end, we have an estimator that uh, can capture the conditional dependency between some variables super quickly. And how are we going to use this? Now let's get to the FOSA. So what FOSA does is that basically we have n sample of our variables y and this x1 to xp. At the beginning, we have a set which we just let it be equal to the empty set. And I'm going to go step by step and put some variables into this set S and uh, uh, increase its size. Uh, and let's see how, how do we do that. So in the first step of foresight, basically what we do is that we calculate the dependency of Y on each of these single variables, X1 to XT. And then we see which one of them is going to maximize this dependency. The one that is going to maximize, we are going to put it into our set S hat. N now let's go to the second step. In the second step, I've already chosen this one, XJ1, as the, in the previous step. Now I'm going to see, okay, conditional on the variable that I've already picked and selected, what are the, which, which other variable is going to maximize this dependency with Y? I'm going to pick that one as a as uh, the second variable j2 and add it to my set the, the next step is similar so i've already picked xj1 and xj2 conditional on xj1 and xj2 i'm going to see which one of the remaining variables is going to have the highest amount of dependency with what with y and pick that index and put it into my set now you may ask that okay when are you gonna stop because this procedure may continue until i run out of all the remaining variables but fortunately the algorithm tells us when we need to stop note that the what this algorithm is doing is basically doing that okay i have selected a bunch of variables is there any of the remaining variables um, worthy to add to my set of to this set as had and by worthy what I mean is that conditional on the set that I've already selected, is there any xk remaining such that this value is positive? And if the answer to this question is no, in the sense that there's no variable that has positive dependency with y, given the selected set of variables, I need to stop because it's basically saying that Given the set of variables that I have already selected, there is no dependency with the rest of the variables. So this is the what our foresight does. So with, in these settings, basically uh, we have shown that with uh, with some under very mild assumptions, basically this set S hat that foresight selects is a mark of blanket. Means that uh, given this set y is independent of all the rest of the variables but note that basically this um, this result does not make any claim on the size of this mark mark of blanket particularly it does not say that this is the minimal mark of blanket or this is the mark of boundary what we need was the mark of boundary basically 
And note that foci is a greedy algorithm because in each, each step it was basically looking at the variable that, that was, that, uh, was uh, making the dependency the highest and this greediness always caused a problem and here it's not no exception. Here also the greediness of foci can make problems and actually here I can show you an example that how easily we can find situations that the greediness of foci makes it uh, basically not go into the optimal direction. So in this example, I have my uh, variable y and these two red variables x1 and x2 are the parents and x3 is the grandparent. And then what I did, um, I just considered a simple example in which um, I have these relationships between x1, x2, uh, x3 and y. Uh, so, for example, you can take x3 as a normal random variable and then let x1 be the sign of x3 from some noise and x2 the absolute value of x3 plus some noise and y be the x1 times x2. So, uh, note that if the uh, strength of noise here that I control it with this value of alpha, if I take the, if I, if I uh, assume that alpha, if this alpha is small enough, what I'm trying to do with making alpha small is that uh, I'm boldening the role of x3 in this example. What will happen is that x3 would contribute more than x1 and x2 to the dependence, uh, to, the, to the structure of y, and therefore y will end up having higher dependency with x3 rather than higher dependency with x1 and x2. So what will happen is that if I choose alpha small enough, my, this foci algorithm is going to first pick x3. Of course, because I, all, I still have this noise variables epsilon and epsilon2 which contribute to y, foci would select uh, x2 and x1 at the end, but it is actually selecting a set that is a superset of the Markov boundary, so I will end up having x1, x2, and x3. So this x3 thing is going to be an extra variable, and therefore I will not get the mark of boundary, and that is troublemaking. So can we somehow uh, characterize this problem in a way to, um, like in a, like in a mathematical way, and find situations when we can say that, okay, in this situation, we, sh we are sure that this problem does, is not occurring. So, not that what was causing the problem, basically the problem was coming from the fact that this x3, which is not part of the Markov boundary, was contributing to the, depend to the uh, uh, dependency structure more than the variables that are actually in the Markov boundary. So if I want to mathematically write this down, I first need to have this definition. So define Q as this... Uh, uh, value basically, you don't really need to actually uh, care about the <laughs> uh, precise definition of it because you can actually think of Q as the numerator of this uh, measure of dependence codec. Remember that codec was a, a, a ratio of two integrals, which the denominator is actually a normalizing constant, so we cannot only care about the numerator of it. So define a Q of Y and XS in this sense, which basically is trying to say how much uh, this vector XS uh, causes dependency of Y. And so to mathematically write down what, 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 what do we need to avoid foresight to, uh, to um, like add extra uh, variables to the set as had, uh, which basically need to say that, okay, given any set that is a subset of the Markov boundary, if I pick a variable from the Markov boundary, so i is from the Markov boundary, and a variable that is not from the Markov boundary, q of s uh, and i is going to be more than q of s and j by this value of delta. What I'm trying to say here is that uh, variables that are from the Markov boundary are go um, need to contribute to uh, Y 
uh, with amount of delta more than the variables that are outside of the Markov boundary. And this is just a way of writing things down, not really important. So clearly, the, because I defined it this way, now if we assume that uh, our structure has this property, which we call it a delta gap property, delta gap in the sense that the gap of dependency of y with the variables in the Markov boundary is delta more than the variables outside of the Markov boundary. If I have this delta gap, uh, delta Markov gap property, then obviously FOSA is actually going to give us the Markov boundary with high probability, and it will not give us an over a, a, a superset of the Markov boundary. But okay, here you may say that this all seems a little bit artificial. You just say that you need to have something, and then. You write it down mathematically and then you define it as a property, but at the end of the day, we don't really have the Markov boundary, so I cannot really check this property, so what all this story is about. But I, I agree, this all is a bit weird, but we can, for example, say what are the scenarios that 100% even, even without checking, I'm sure that this property will hold. And one of them, we, we call it tree neighborhood. So what, what do I mean by tree neighborhood? Is that if you look at the neighborhood of Y in the DAG, there's basically no cycle going through the uh, elements of the Markov boundary of Y. So the neighborhood of Y in the DAG lo would look like actually a tree. And it is easy to show that if I have this tree neighborhood property, then I have a delta such that I have this delta Markov gap property. So, any questions? Um, I think Armin did a great uh, job hey, in answering all the questions. Yeah, we can awesome. answer it. Thanks. Okay. Now, okay, just a recap of what I said. So, what we wanted to do was finding the set of parents. We said that, okay, let's make the the set that we are searching over a little bit smaller so we said that okay it's enough to look at the markov boundary we found a way to find the markov boundary and now i have the markov boundary which means that i have this extra stuff children and a spouse is there a way that i can get rid of this extra stuff and just get to the point that i wanted to um, have at the beginning just a set of parents and how do we do that so we we have we just with some we have some observations that help us to have the next step of the algorithm to get to the set of parents. So first of all, note that if x i and x j both of them are parents of y, then if I find the Markov boundary of x i and x j, they belong to each other. So x i belong to uh, the mark of the basically the index i belongs to the mark of boundary of x j and j also belongs to the mark of boundary of x i. This is because parents have to share the same children, which is y actually. So they have this kind of a, a symmetric relationship of being in each other's mark of boundary. This always happens. This is always the case. And if we have the tree neighborhood property. We have some one extra, uh, we can make one extra observation that comes handy, and that's it. So take a, a node which is in the Markov boundary, but it's not a parent. So it's either a children or it's a spouse. Then find the Markov boundary of that non parental node of Y, and note that there is no uh, intersection with the set of parents of Y. So Markov boundary of any non-parental node does not contain any parent of Y. And that's because Y is blocking the information between the set of parents and the set of children and the spouses. Now, with these two observations, we are going to do something. So uh, here is this to my toy example. From this two example, I want to tell you what I'm going to do. So note that these are this, these these uh, red nodes are the set of parents, right? And I said that always we know that if I calculate the Markov boundary of parents, they belong to each other's Markov boundary. 
So from this observation, I'm going to make an undirected graph, which I'm just going to call it G star of Y, in this way. The node set of these uh, undirected graph is going to contain all the nodes in the Markov boundary of Y. And how I'm going to uh, make the H set, the H set is going to consist of all pairs of I and J such that they belong to each other's Markov boundary. So in this two example, I will end up having this undirected graph. So note that all the parents are connected to each other here because x6 is the, is the parent of x5. I will have this component and here x4 does not have any overlap. The Markov boundary of x4 does not have any overlap with the other. So it would be this isolated single tone aside. So basically what I did was that I created this uh, undirected graph, which is telling me something. This undirected graph is consists of some components. Notice that each component is a, full, uh, is a fully connected subgraph like this or this. These are all fully connected. And then, so after, after ha getting these um, fully connected subgraphs that are disjoint of each other, basically I can focus on each of these uh, subgraphs and search within those subgraphs. You can see here that one of these subgraphs contains all the set of parents. And how, how am I going to get to that? So, uh, Note that if I again have this tree neighborhood property, there is at most one of these components of these connected components of this undirected graph such that all the pairwise uh, nodes in this uh, uh, subgraph are independent of each other. So, for example, here, x1, x2, and x3, if you uh, do independence tests between any two of them, they are all going to be independent of each other. But this component, x5 and x is are actually dependent on each other. So, uh, if you do a test of independence, you're going to reject the hypothesis. And uh, so, if I have a, a tree neighborhood assumption, what will happen is that exact, exactly one of these uh, GIs, the, the, uh, this, this, this fully connected, uh, the, the connected components of G star is going to have this property that all the pairwise independence tests are going to be accepted, and that component is going to be the set of parents. So to summarize what I've said is we have this algorithm. So let's say that I have a sample of size n of my variables. What I need to do is to basically figure out the Markov boundary of y and the Markov boundary of each node in the Markov boundary of y. So uh, I, I find the Markov boundary of y. For each member in the Markov boundary of y, I calculate the Markov boundary. Then I, now I'm in this position to create this undirected G star graph. To create the undirected G star graph, I add the edges with this relationship. And then to find the, that connected component that is representing the parents, I'm going to do pairwise independence tests. And note that so far, I haven't done any conditional independence testing or anything else like that thanks to the assumption of three neighborhood property that I'm doing. So at the beginning, I talked about uh, this uh, um, Markov equivalence class stuff. But after that, uh, you didn't hear anything about it. Now it's the time that we talk about it again. So what will happen is that there are situations in which actually I cannot identify exactly for 100% that, for example, this is the set of parents, and that situation occurs when y has um, one parent and a bunch of children that don't have spouses. For example, consider this situation, that I have y, and I have x1 as parent, and I have a bunch of child that they don't have any other parent. x3, x4. In this situation, you can have this graph 
as the as your true uh, as as your as the DAG that you are interested in, or you can have this graph. Wait, I did not put that much space to hmm. And let's draw it here. You can have this one. Why? Uh, this one I want to say that okay, x two is the parent. right so any of these two can be this can be the solution so here x1 is the parent but in this equivalent that x2 is the parent so what am i gonna do is that my algorithm basically is instead of uh, outputting just one set and claiming that this is the set of parent is going to output a collection of sets that say that okay if actually the set of parents are not identifiable you may have this situation this situation this situation so i will output as a collection of sets of parents and um yeah that's it and we'll just uh, let me tell you that okay actually can we give you some guarantees for this algorithm whether it actually works in practice or not and the answer is fortunately yes so these are some assumptions that we need. We can go back to it, uh, but I'm just going to tell you what the, they are saying. The first assumption is just telling us that uh, the, prob the conditional probability distribution of y given the variables of it, given the other variables need to be smooth in the sense that it needs to be kind of had, follows a Lipschitz-ness property. If I change the variables that I'm conditioning on, the probability distribution of y should not change drastically. The other assumption is basically just making sure that the support, the size of the support of uh, my variables is not crazy big. I can bound them somehow. And the last property is the delta Markov gap property that we talked about. So given these three assumptions, uh, the first guarantee that we have is that if we have these uh, three assumptions, include and the three neighborhood property for y then with high probability the output of for psi actually consists of all the parent of sets so we we can actually with high probability capture all those sets that are parents of y uh, the next result is okay I don't know whether I have the three neighborhood assumption or uh, property or not. And honestly, in reality, there are many situations that you cannot test. I mean, you, you can't really test whether uh, a data set that you have follows this three neighborhood property or not. Uh, what can we say in that case? If we do not know anything about this property, under again those same assumptions, but this time without assuming that Y has this three neighborhood property, we can say that, okay, the output of foci does not make any false discoveries in the, with high probability in the sense that I would output a bunch of sets and with high probability, I assure you that none of these sets contain any non-parental set. So in, in this sense, we have sort of a conservative algorithm that makes sure that, okay, I may not give you any set but if I give you any, it will not contain anything extra. Uh, so, I, sorry yes. to interrupt you, just to remind yes. you of the time. You have around 10 minutes left. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, sure. So now let's uh, just see in like with a simulated example how this whole algorithm actually works. So here, consider this graph. I'm going to focus on these two nodes, x6 and x11. So note that the parents of x6 are x2, x3, and x4, and the parents of x11 are x6, x8, and x2. Just have the whole picture in mind, it's not uh, important. And I have created this graph in a way that I'm sure that it satisfies this three neighborhood property that I wanted. And the relationship, I'm just, just going to generate uh, a bunch of samples from uh, this graph using these relationships that you can see here. And just note that I, I randomly actually, honestly, picked these relationships, so they are not really linear. I even uh, added some situations where the noise is not additive, so it, it, it's, it's as crazy as you can imagine. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, see what, how is the performance of my algorithm using the Jacquard index. So Jacquard index, what it does is that 
If you want to see how much two sets overlap, you can use Jacquard index, which is the size of the intersection of those two sets uh, divided by the size of the union, and it's going to be between zero and one. If it's near one, means that these two sets actually are 100% overlapping, and it's, if it's close to zero, means that the overlap is small. And it also take, uh, takes into account if you add too much stuff to your set. So if you, if you have a lot of extra uh, elements, then the JJR card uh, index tends to be near zero. So here is uh, how my uh, algorithm behaves. So I have created situations with sample size from 2,000 to 10,000. And here you can see that the Jacquard index is increasing uh, with, this, uh, with uh, the growing sample size. And um, yeah, so you can check the other uh, ingredients of this table later if you are interested. But let's go to the next um, slide, which is actually a comparison of the performance of our algorithm with the other existing algorithms uh, in the literature. So here I picked the sample size of 10 to the 4 and what I did, uh, I, I compared our algorithm, which we call it DAG foci, with PC using partial correlation as the test of conditional independence, PC using Hilbert Schmidt uh, independence criterion, hill climbing, which is a Bayesian uh, approach for uh, finding the, uh, like estimating the DAGs, uh, causal additive model, and this one is uh, by Chickering, but I forgot what is the abbreviation for. So, um, so here you can see that in this case, when we had X6, which is actually a situation in which the signal and noise are all additive, PC with H6 is doing the best, but our algorithm is doing the second best compared to the other methods. And in this situation with X11, uh, the relationship was more crazy. So it was not really additive. Uh, um, the X, X, X11 was not the additive function of the other signal variables. And our algorithm is doing the best in terms of uh, exact recovery and the Jacquard index, but not in terms of uh, missing edges. Uh, so uh, to me, it seems that it's doing sort of a good job. Um, so to summarize what we have done, we have a computationally efficient algorithm to identify the set of parents of a variable of interest. We have finite sample guarantees. We have very little distributional assumptions. We did not require any conditional independence testing, which was thanks to the assumption that we made the tree neighborhood assumption. And it is somehow conservative in the sense that it may not output something, but if it output, it does not contain any false discoveries. Uh, and what we would love to do is that, okay, there are many situations that we can actually do uh, this stuff, improve our um, method way better if we incorporate actually the test of conditional independence. We have not considered a situation in which there is a latent conf confounding variables and that's, uh, that would be amazing if we can study that area. And also in situations where we do not have the delta Markov gap property, is there a smart way of doing, doing some pruning to get to the Markov boundary and do the rest of this stuff? Uh, with this being said, uh, thank you very much, and yes, I'm done. All right, yeah, thanks for the, <clears throat> thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, we're going to now move to the discussion. So we'll have uh, Brian present some slides, and after that, uh, you'll have to, the opportunity to respond. All right, yeah, Brian, whenever you're ready. All right, let me just get my slides up here. Here we go. All right. Can you all see the slides? Um, let's, yep. Now we can see it. Yep. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, so uh, first of all, I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this discussion. Uh, and thanks, Mona, for uh, the really great presentation on a topic that is uh, quite near and dear to my heart. So I'm excited to be giving uh, this discussion. This is a problem that I've sort of thought a lot about. 
uh, over the past few years. Uh, and I also have to give credit uh, to my student, Ming Gao, who helped me uh, put together uh, some of the discussion here. Uh, so the way I'm going to structure this discussion is I'll start by giving just like a quick summary of sort of my main takeaways uh, from this paper, uh, and then to sort of uh, maybe provide some support for why I think this is an interesting problem. I want to walk through some of the history uh, of structure learning and particularly, particularly focused on uh, non-parametric aspects. Uh, and then uh, with that sort of uh, backdrop, I'll kind of circle back and um, discuss some of the assumptions uh, and ask some questions from Mona and we can uh, discuss from there. Uh, so um, my sort of overall impression from this paper is that really uh, the basic idea is trying to better understand the statistical properties of structure learning uh, without making parametric assumptions. Uh, so the, the overall idea is causal structure learning with minimal assumptions on the functional relationships of noise. So not having to make assumptions like additive independent noise that are very common in the literature. Uh, and particularly uh, proposing an algorithm to return the parents of a specific node in a causal DAG as opposed to returning the entire DAG, which I think is a, a interesting simplification. Uh, and uh, if you haven't taken a look at this previous work, uh, that Mona uh, and her collaborators have worked on on this codec measure, I, I highly encourage you to. So there's been a lot of follow-up work and interest on this, uh, on finding fast uh, and simple measures of conditional independence. Uh, and what I think was maybe the most interesting takeaway that I got was this result that uh, Mona mentioned on conservative false discovery control when the model assumptions uh, were violated. Uh, so if I got anything wrong there, uh, please jump in and let me know. Uh, but uh, let me start by saying, by asking a simple question, which is, what do we already know about the statistical properties of non-parametric structure learning? I think this will uh, help us sort of uh, situate uh, what I think the most interesting aspects of this work are a little bit better. So um, before we get to the non-parametric part, let's start, uh, take a step back and just ask, like, what do we know about the statistical properties of structure learning algorithms? Well, of course, the answer is, a whole lot. This literature dates back at least four decades. You could argue it dates back uh, a century. Um, some of the early results uh, on identifiability focused on uh, things like faithfulness, learning the Markov equivalence class, and things like uh, PC algorithm, GES. Um, and then in the 2000s, uh, there were results that showed how to identify the actual DAG itself. So, of course, as many of you are certainly aware, the Markov equivalence class does not identify the DAG itself, uh, but there was a series of results on uh, linear non-Gaussian models, additive noise models, post nonlinear models, uh, and more recently uh, equal or known variance models that do in fact identify um, the exact DAG itself. There's also recent work um, from Uhler and colleagues on the sparsest Markov assumption. These are all, uh, sort of pretty well-known identifiability results at this point. Uh, and one of the things that I, I think is important to emphasize maybe from a statistical perspective, uh, with apologies to the statisticians that know of the counterexamples to what I'm about to say, I'm sort of uh, uh, glossing over some technical details here, but under very weak conditions, uh, assuming your model isn't uh, completely pathological, uh, deriving point-wise consistent estimators uh, is generally guaranteed automatically. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the literature uh, that I mentioned above, um, the consistent estimators essentially come from a constructive identification proof, um, which is relatively uh, straightforward. So the interesting thing was in, in 2003, uh, and this may have been pointed out earlier, I'm not sure, but the, the first uh, result that I'm aware of uh, was from uh, Robbins and collaborators pointing out that under the faithfulness assumption, um, that there cannot be uniformly consistent estimators of a Markov equivalence class. Uh, and around the same time, there were results, this is where the strong faithfulness assumption came from, um, that showed that, okay, if you strengthen the faithfulness assumption uh, in a uniform way, then you can regain uniform consistency. And then uh, a few years later, there was follow-up work uh, on the geometry of the strong faithfulness assumption by Uhler and colleagues. Um, that showed that uh, the strong faithfulness assumption can be hard to satisfy uh, in a particular sense. Um, so the, the point here is, is basically to emphasize that there's been a lot of work on identifiability and consistency 
uh, largely in parametric models, but some in non-parametric models. Uh, but these are really only the most basic statistical properties that we could ask for, right? Um, you can really go a lot deeper than this. So for example, what about things like finite sample properties? So um, one of the earliest results that I'm aware of uh, is a result uh, in the 2000s on the PC algorithm uh, due to Peter Bullman uh, and collaborators on uniform consistency of the PC algorithm under strong faithfulness assumptions. Uh, and then this was followed up by uh, a lot of work on say like non-paranormal models, uh, the maximum likelihood estimator in Gaussian and linear SEM models. Then there was results on equal variances, LinGAM models, and more recently, uh, there have been several uh, minimax optimality results in lower bounds for this type of problem. So um, I don't, I'm not listing out specific papers here because at this point there have been sort of a lot of work along these lines, but you'll notice that it's certainly a lot more recent um, than the earlier work I had on the previous slide. And then of course, the other direction to bring us back to uh, Mona's presentation is, so what about non-parametric models? And here, I think um, sort of, the point that I want to emphasize is that while there is plenty of work, it's, there's certainly a lot less. Um, and so um, I mentioned the non-paranormal PC paper. There's the work on causal additive models and partially linear models uh, from Peter Bullman's group, uh, work on generalized score functions uh, uh, in relation to uh, generalized equivalent search. Uh, and then um, uh, more recently, I have a paper uh, with Ming on entropic assumptions, which we'll, I'll, I'll mention in just a second. Um, so so the, the point is sort of to, to emphasize that there's still a lot that we have to look here. Um, and which is one of the things that I think um, the, the presentation today, I think makes it so interesting. Now, one thing, one caveat I have to put here is of course in principle, uh, algorithms like the PC algorithm are non-parametric and always were non-parametric. They only needed a consistent conditional independence test uh, however, uh, developing finite sample guarantees for non-parametric conditional independence tests is a hard uh, problem. Uh, and this is where some of the work of Mona and, and her collaborators comes into play. Um, recently, there's been lots of progress on, for example, uh, minimax optimal tests for discrete and continuous distributions, uh, results on the hardness of testing without assumptions, and then, of course, uh, the codec algorithm uh, that Mona mentioned uh, in her presentation. Uh, which is what um, today's presentation built upon. Okay, so one more slide on history. Uh, since today's uh, presentation focused a lot on learning Markov boundaries, um, I thought it would be good to, to point out um, uh, what we sort of know about this problem as well. So of course, just like with uh, learning Bayesian networks, there's also uh, decades of work on algorithms for learning Markov blankets. Um, I put some of the, maybe some of the more well-known algorithms here. Uh, with apologies to, to the many, many algorithms that I left out here, things like GS, uh, I am, Python, these types of algorithms. Um, the interesting thing that sort of stood out uh, when I worked on this a little while ago was that there didn't seem to be very much finite sample work. Uh, and so in this paper that I mentioned um, uh, just a minute ago, we, uh, Ming and I gave some finite sample guarantees for learning Markov boundaries uh, under very similar conditions to the conditions that uh, Mona and her collaborators provided. Uh, essentially this Delta Markov gap condition, essentially that's really what you need. Uh, and and the, the idea in all of these algorithms, not just um, uh, the recent work, but also even the older work, if you go back to things like Gross Shrink, it's all the same idea. You're greedily adding variables that have the highest association. Um, and I think, so, so Mona, you had mentioned um, trying to find conditions where you could maybe get rid of the gap condition and do pruning. So it's sort of, there are these like backward phases um, that I'm sure you're familiar with um, that will also provably um, recover um, the Markov boundary. Now the precise conditions that are needed in finite samples, um, that's also something um, that, that definitely needs more work. Okay, so with that sort of historical perspective, I hope this sort of, um, serves to illustrate um, that there's, uh, while there's a lot that's known about structural learning in general, what's known about finite sample non-parametric properties, uh, it, this is sort of much less well studied. And so um, I think uh, this makes the work from uh, Mona and her collaborators uh, particularly important and significant. 
Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these assumptions here because Mona talked about them, but I thought it'd be good to kind of put all of the assumptions on, on one slide because I was sort of curious myself what, what this would look like. And it's hard to say, you know, these are uh, genuinely non-parametric conditions. Um, it, my sense is, uh, and please feel free to jump in uh, if I missed something here, that really the, the two operative conditions, the really important ones, uh, are this sort of tree-like properties, this neighborhood, uh, tree neighborhood property, I believe you called it, and the Delta Markov gap condition. Uh, so this Delta Markov, Markov gap condition uh, has appeared in previous work uh, in a slightly different context. Uh, and it's been shown previously, and again, Mona sort of talked about this in the presentation, that when you have some type of tree-like condition, this condition will always be satisfied. So an interesting question would be um, under what other conditions you can guarantee that this forward greedy search procedure is sufficient um, to recover the Markov boundary. Now, interestingly, one, so I, one of the things that I, I thought was uh, most interesting from this paper was that to go beyond this, uh, um, uh, this paper showed that you can get some type of false discovery control when the tree-like assumptions are violated. So I thought this was quite interesting. Okay. Um, so, uh, to summarize uh, and, and maybe ask some questions, uh, I hope I've sort of managed to sort of uh, give a little bit of context behind why uh, non-parametric structure learning is an important and perhaps understudied problem. Uh, and uh, Mona's presentation today uh, and the paper uh, certainly makes noteworthy progress in this problem. It's genuinely non-parametric, uh, makes very weak assumptions compared to existing work. There's no tuning parameters, which uh, also was uh, quite surprising to me. Um, it's high dimensional. And um, there's also some in the, in the paper, I thought there was really nice discussion of uh, what happens in the case of interventions as well. So I have a bunch of questions here. Uh, I don't know that we'll have enough time to go through them all. So I highlighted what I think are the two most important ones. The rest are kind of like more technical ones, uh, but I'll leave them uh, for Mona in case she's interested. But the two main questions that I wanted to ask are, um, so to come back to this discussion about uh, existing Markov boundary learning algorithms, um, do you think there's any fundamental differences between foci and these existing approaches uh, based on forward greedy search? Um, so my impression was that it's very similar, just you're using a different uh, dependence measure, but maybe I missed something. And the second question was, um, so briefly you had mentioned that the second step only involves pairwise marginal testing. Uh, and given the fact that there's this tree-like assumption, this kind of sounds a lot like a Chalu type uh, approach. And I was wondering if, there's, if, there, if you found any connections between this approach and the Chalu algorithm. Uh, and I won't, uh, we can continue the discussion from there, but I'll start with just those two questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It was, okay, so how much time do I have? Yeah, like two, three minutes for. Research. Okay. Yeah. yeah for, so for the first question, yeah, as you as you mentioned clearly, um, the 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 foci and other greedy based algorithms for Markov boundary research are basically the same. Foci is nothing fancy at all. It's just using this measure of conditional independence and all of the properties that it carries on. It's basically thanks to the measure. So the algorithm itself is nothing new. So with Chow Liu, actually, unfortunately, I would say that I it's a bit dusty or mean if you have any comments, because I know that you are more familiar with it. If you can jump in and help me in this. Uh, I, I Unfortunately, I cannot help. It's also a question that I had thought about, but I <laughs> could not resolve completely what the connection to Chow Liu is, uh, because, of course, that's a very famous algorithm for learning um, with the tree assumption, but I don't quite know the, the connection. Uh, yeah, that's, that, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, I somehow, I don't remember the exact details, so I cannot answer that question. <laughs> no worries, uh, it's just one of the random thoughts I had uh, as I was reading the paper. Uh, one other thing that I, 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 I was wondering about, this, there were certain, this is the fifth question that I have here, is that there, I noticed in several places in the paper that you mentioned that the algorithm was efficient. Uh, and I noticed, so the, the foci algorithm runs in n log n time, but was there a discussion of the computational complexity of the entire procedure, including learning the parents? I may, maybe I missed that. Yeah, no, no, actually I, 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 I didn't mention it. So basically you need to run foci for 
the variable y and then after you figured out the Markov boundary of y you need to run foci for each of the single elements in the Markov boundary so basically you need to do Markov boundary plus one times foci so if the size of the Markov boundary is not small you will end up having doing like this n log n time many times uh, which might be too much but yeah that depends how how large how how connected basically y is to the rest of the nodes I see. Great. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I think the rest of the questions, maybe we can, we can discuss offline. Uh, I don't want to take up uh, too much more time. How do we have any, do we have much more time or. I, I can just quickly wrap up and then you can continue a little bit more. If sure. You, sure. If you want. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. First, wait one second. First. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mona, for the very nice talk. Thank you, Brian, for the, for the interesting discussion. Also, thank you to Armin for uh, helping out in Q and A. Uh, next week, we're going to have Amir Emad uh, Ghazami from Trans Hop Tran Hopkins University, who will talk about combining experimental and observational data for identification and estimation of long-term causal effects. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you have a great week and uh, see you next time.